So hello and welcome and happy Friday. Today is Friday, November the 17th, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 233. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. So I want to thank you for being here today. A super rainy day. The warm weather shifted. Boy, yesterday was fantastic, and today it just went to the dogs here. What's the humidity level outside? 100% because it's raining right now. Full-time rain. 52 degrees Fahrenheit. 2.5 mile an hour winds. This is not a day for keeping bees. Great day for watching YouTube. So here we are. If you want to know what we're going to talk about today, please look down in the video description and you'll see all the topics listed in order. If you want to know how to submit your own topic, then you go to thewaytobe.org. There'll also be a link to that down in the video description and it'll take you to the page. You fill out a form and you never know. Your topic might show up on a Friday. So I want to thank you for being here today and we're going to jump right into it. Why fool around? The very first question comes from Matt from Niagara, Wisconsin. I have a bee behavior question. It says... This time, are you aware of any research into direction of bee foraging related to the orientation of the colony entrance? I've noticed anecdotally that most scouts or foragers that exit my hive seem to begin their flights in the general direction of the hive's entrance. I know that when there's a good resource, pollen, nectar, etc., in another direction, they do eventually tend to find it. And I see foragers coming and going in whatever direction necessary to get those resources, but I also wonder if there may be a proclivity to foraging in a particular direction at first. Thanks. Okay, so here's the thing. That's an interesting question. And I think the direction of your landing board or entrance of your hive is kind of important, but not so much for foraging. I think uh, for a lot of people that are thinking about putting up their beehives for the first time, Thinking about the direction of the entrance is very important. We don't want to aim it towards a thoroughfare where people are driving or parking their cars. We don't want people to be walking past it. You also don't want to aim it directly at your wall. Some people aim their hive straight at the side wall of their garage, for example. It doesn't mean that the bees can't navigate and eventually find their way. They do, but there are advantages too. for example, having your entrance facing south by southeast. And this is a northern hemisphere question because uh, in the wintertime our sun is coming out of the south. So the bees do benefit overall. I have beehives facing many different directions. When it comes to foraging, it's not so much the direction of the entrance that's important as much as hive placement. And the reason is when you have forage in one particular direction relevant to the position of your beehives, it uh, is a big advantage to the bees if they're flying against the wind toward the forage source. So one advantage is that the source is generating a scent that would entice the bees. So if they're obviously upwind and the wind blows down and across your beehives, they'll find that scent first and of course go directly to whatever it's coming from. The other end of that is, I don't know if you realize how much work it is for the bees to come back when they're fully loaded. When they fly out empty, maybe they have a little honey or nectar with them to give them the energy they need to fly, for example, if they're going a long distance. But uh, once they load up on pollen and nectar, they can weigh more than 50% more on their way back. So if they're coming back with the wind, that's another advantage to having them downwind from a source. You'll notice that when your bees come out of your hive, if you want them to avoid people having a stockade fence or something like that, Near the entrance of the hive forces them up and over. They can't just fly straight across the sidewalk, for example. And if you look at the bees, you'll notice that they come out and they do a really lazy corkscrew as they look around and then they keep going up and up and up and then they go in the direction they want to go in. So the direction of the hive's entrance does not, uh, for example, direct your bees to a specific source. It's really driven by vision. So they're looking at the landscape features because they're orienting to what they already know about the area. So once they find a source, then they can get back to it. When bees are scouting and they haven't found a source yet, so new bees, new to the out of doors, for example, they're just maturing and getting older. 
uh, they scout in a variety of different directions. They inspect every little thing. Uh, keep in mind too that when your scouts are first going out when they're young, they're usually getting their information from the dance floor. So senior scouts, older scouts that know where resources are, come back and they do a waggle dance on the dance floor. Newbies that haven't been out yet or haven't found the sources get that information from bees that are already telling them where it's at. So the waggle dance gives that information. And then they fly off even in groups often. So I think bees also, I don't have any science behind it. I think they see bees flying in specific directions and they might tend to kind of go in the direction other bees are flying already. So, but it's an interesting question. The direction is not that important. Location is. Moving right along, question number two comes from Linda. I know I'm going to mess up this name. Osoyos, British Columbia. O-S-O-Y-O-O-S. -O I'm interested in the plans for the porch over the landing boards, but couldn't find them. As a new beekeeper, I have so many questions and just keep cycling through the videos. Okay, so here's the thing. These porches, they're actually called hive visors. And when you look at most of my beehives, almost all of them have them now. And it's just an awning that goes over the front landing board and they're adjustable. They have thumb screws. So you can raise them or lower them depending on what your weather conditions are, or how many boxes are on the hive. If we're trying to provide a place for them to seek shelter, if they're, for example, bearding outside the hive, instead of hanging underneath the landing board, they move up the face of the hive and under these hive visors. There isn't a video or there isn't a, a link to plans for it, but I will link a video. So if you look down under question number two, you'll see a YouTube link which shows you exactly how to build your own and what all the pieces and parts are. That's something that I will continue to use and put on my hives. It's not on some of my hives. Uh, it is on most of them. And what are the advantages of it? Other than it does provide shelter. It keeps rain from falling down on your landing board like today, right now. Uh, we would lower the high visor closer to the landing board and then that keeps rain off of it. And uh, so when the bees are coming and going on the landing board, they're not getting soaked right there. The other thing is it keeps snow and ice also off of your entrance. So that's helpful. Keep in mind that we've put a landing board on our beehives. Uh, some of my hives do not have landing boards, but those that do, we have a place where snow and things like that can pile up. So a high visor can help prevent or greatly reduce it. Uh, and the other thing is, because I've got like nucleus hives, for example, that only have a front entrance and no landing board. And uh, they, of course, don't need it to protect them from rain on that part. But it does provide, again, a place for the bees to cluster if they're surplus and they're, they're bearding outside to get out of the way of those that are drying down your honey. So that link will be in the video description and you can find it. it's just called the high visor. By the way, that's not a new innovation. Uh, there's a book back here, the ABC and XYZ of bee culture, which goes way back and they were using high visors even back in the day. I don't think they called them that, but they had mounted visors over the front of the entrance and it's just something that went out of style. If you're in a really hot zone, it drops the face of your hive or the landing board by at least 15 degrees under midday sun. So it's an advantage. Question number three comes from Ed, Winona, Minnesota. Can you explain what a vertical, ex what a vertical split is and how it's done? Okay, vertical splits are not something I personally like to do but I will explain it. Why? Because I have the gear already and it was the thumbnail for today's video. This is something that you can look up for yourself. This is called a Snell Grove board. And the whole purpose of it is it's a spacer. They come in eight or 10 frame sizes. It might be interesting if somebody made them in nucleus hive size too. A vertical split. We're splitting a beehive. This is something that we need to learn about now. Winter's coming. Winter is basically here, let's face it. In the springtime, you may be talking about uh, creating a split to keep your bees around. And so when you do that, I like to create an entirely different box. So I like to take a nucleus hive and pull my brood frames from the parent hive, which would be the eight or 10 frame brood box. And then pull two or three frames of brood out with the queen. 
And the reason I do that is because if I pull the queen away and put her in another hive, I created an insurance policy. The bees then that are left behind, that are on their way to swarming, let's say, uh, then they will feel some relief. Some congestion in the brood box is reduced, and I'm creating another colony of bees, which is an insurance policy. If they don't requeen, I can bring them all back. Now, so that would be, let's call it a horizontal split. We took them out of the brood box, we created another hive, side by side, separate spot altogether. You can also do the same thing by putting one box directly on top of the other. Now you might be thinking to yourself, can't I just put a queen excluder in there and uh, keep my queen down below, pull some frames of brood with eggs, put a queen excluder in there, and then with my new brood and eggs above, won't they just make another queen up there? And they won't with a queen excluder, and here's why. We need to separate them so they can't touch each other. And by touch each other, I mean with their tongues. If we just had a queen excluder, the workers move freely through it. So they're going to be spreading the queen's pheromone through the whole hive, even if we created that barrier. So we need a barrier that's double screen. And that's what this is. There are two screens in here that no bees can pass through. So really what we're doing is instead of creating a, another hive box that's off to the side, we're going to put another hive box on top and we're going to have the brood box down below. We have to provide this upper box with its own entrance because remember they can't get down through here, they can't go down to the bottom brood box, and we want them to not have the queen's continuing pheromone up above. So why combine them one directly over the other? The reason is the new colony that's up here that gets those frames of eggs that we hope to have them produce a new uh, queen. So when they start queen cells and they're meaningful and they're in production, that's a great time to do a split, put them in the box directly above and fill the rest of the frames, of course, as much as you can with drawn comb if you have it. If not, let them draw it out. The upper box has the advantage. What advantage would it be? Well, the warmth generator from the colony down below, guess what? We just ruined their day because up above they have now this double screen. The warmth from the colony down below passes through, goes right up into the upper box, and they get free heat, which means they burn less calories and they don't burn themselves out, generating the warmth they need to preserve their brood frames and, of course, their developing larvae. One of those being the queen cell or queen cells that you found. Now let's say the entrance that it's on, so the box down here has an entrance on this side, you have options. We have these little twists here and you create another entrance off to the side. You can also create the entrance to the back. So you can flip it like this. This is the front of the hive. You could have an entrance directly off the back, which you don't like because that's the side I like to stand on when I tend the hive. But a single entrance, like don't open a bunch of them. And you'll notice that they have entrances on both sides of this. But uh, you want the entrance to be on the side that's above the double screen. New box, new entrance, no top venting, no more entrances on that box other than what you're having in the snow growth board. Then once they're all set and they're strong and they're growing, you can keep them together, but uh, eventually you're going to want to move one of them, which is one of the reasons why I don't personally like the method of uh, the vertical split, one right on top of the other. And that's because if I'm going to make a split, uh, if I don't want them to have to deal with a big space, which is, you know, with the bigger space, that's why we benefit from the warmth from the colony down below. I would much rather start a new colony and put them in a five frame nucleus hive to start. And then they're in their own position that does not have to be changed later. If it's a vertical split, eventually we're going to have to move these hives and one of them is going to move to another spot. So then we're going to have problems with them wanting to go back to the original spot and so on, where if when we create the split, if we just move them to their new location right off the bat, we don't have that complication and we don't have that piece of equipment and we're not robbing the lower box of the warmth that's passively being generated from those that are warming their brood because these splits would happen when? Usually in spring. But that's how it works. The vertical split then just goes on to produce itself and then when you've got um, everything you need, the advantage, I suppose, with a vertical split over creating another colony entirely, if they fail to make a new queen, right, 
We slow down, uh, of course, their swarm instinct by reducing congestion and everything else. We have another colony up there. They're queenless. So in less than three weeks, you're going to want to make sure that they produce another queen. And if they did not, all we have to do to recombine them is to remove the snow grove board from between them, put the colony back together. But now we've got a double deep. So those are all the options I can think of. And over the top of that, I would highly recommend an insulated inner cover and standard telescoping cover with a feeder shim on top of that. So I hope that helps. Again, I have the snow grove board. Why? So I can teach about it. I don't actually, I don't use them. So because I prefer for the reasons that I already described, I prefer to just start a new colony already on its own foundation, on its own stand, in its own location that will not change later. Question number four comes up, Harvey. And it says, I'm a rooftop beekeeper, hardware store in New Jersey on the Jersey Shore. I've been keeping bees for the past five years. I currently have six colonies, four eight frame double deeps with a medium super on top and two five over five nucleus hives. I'm a typical suburban area and I need to keep swarming at a minimum. In the past, I've been pretty successful in swarm control by pulling the queen and putting her in a nuke and waiting for the queenless hive to make a new one. I've not been so successful with the walkaway splits, 50-50 at best. Getting the queens mated, returning the hive has proven to be a challenge. I just watched your outstanding interview with the inventors of the Keeper's Hive. And uh, during the interview, you brought out your queen isolation frame. And I was thinking that it just might be a new way to control swarming. What if I pulled the queen at the appropriate time and put her in the isolation frame for a week or two, allowing the brood frames to hatch and also carefully checking for swarm cells. Once most of the brood hatches, put her back on the frames to start laying again. If she loads up the frames again, just repeat the process until the swarming instinct passes. My thoughts are that her pheromone will still remain strong throughout the double deeps and might quell the swarming instinct. Or do you think we'll just inhibit the swarming instinct more? Okay. It's actually a great idea. In my opinion, these are just opinions. We're just hanging out, talking about our bees, what we think would work or not. And for Harvey, yeah, that would work. What's it look like? Now, here's the thing. My single queen isolation cage is out in my shop right now. This is the double. So for those of you that don't know, this is what we're talking about. This holds two frames. If we wanted to control, because your rooftop beekeeper in this case, Jersey Shore, you want to make sure you don't want to add more hives uh, to your apiary because you're kind of at your limit. You may even be limited by some kind of regulation in your community how many hives you can have. So this actually would work exactly as described because we would slow down brood production. I like the idea though of two frames, right? You would maintain more than 5,000 worker bees coming out of these two frames. What you wouldn't do is you wouldn't end up expanding the rest of your brood box with uh, a bunch of brood because it would be confined to two frames. So that would keep things going. The goal is, if you're trying to control or restrict the growth of your colony so you don't have to do a split, swarm season shows up early. It shows up usually when you see dandelions in full bloom, and that means yards full of them. By the time you're seeing that happening, you would already want to have your queen on brood frames inside this cage. Then what would happen is, uh, as the nectar flow is getting really strong and moving along two or three weeks later, every area has a swarm season. It's pretty distinctive. This is something you talk about with all your fellow beekeepers. If you join a beekeeping club or an organization that's local to you, they'll all talk about when they see their first swarm, when they see first swarm cells and things like that. Uh, isolating your queen keeps the pheromone going because remember they need physical contact with the queen to spread her pheromone throughout the hive. This is just a queen excluder. That's what the spacing of these bars are, which means workers come and go through this. No one's trapped. Uh, the only thing that could be trapped in here would be drones, but I doubt at that time you would already have drone brood. If you did, keep those frames outside of this. 
So then once it's over with, uh, pull these two frames out and let her start laying again throughout the brood frame. If once again, your brood frame seems to be becoming congested, too much brood, cycle your queen right back in here and do that control without really doing too much damage to your colony's ability to produce. So I think that actually would work. And there's a single frame version of this, by the way, you can get these from Better B. They don't compensate me for saying that, betterb.com. And uh, I like the doubles. I like these for a lot of reasons. One is we know immediately where the queen is when we look through. If you find eggs somewhere else when you open it, you're too late, you've already got another queen somewhere, assuming this queen is still on the frames. I've never had one get out of one of these, so. I like them. I recommend every backyard beekeeper have them because we're finding more reasons to use them all the time, single or double. Same thing when you catch a swarm or something like that uh, and you find the queen, that's key. If you put the queen inside one of these, uh, she can't get out and it anchors the swarm into the hive until she's laid enough eggs to get your bees to make a commitment to the hive that they're in. Now I want to, since we're talking about this, caution you about putting a new queen in here that you're unfamiliar with. Because if she's a brand new queen, she could have swarmed and she may not yet be mated. So if you don't see eggs fairly quickly in here, you need to release that queen right away because she may actually not be mated and we need to get her out to do that within the first couple of weeks, right? So that's all I can think about cautionary tale wise. If this is a, this holds two frames, but it takes up the space of three. So that's pretty much it. But yeah, I actually like the idea. Uh, more and more we're talking about, I was talking with Cayman Reynolds um, and springtime when people are treating for Varroa mites too, it kind of came up. Um, people that are trying to keep their populations down so that they don't swarm. For those that use Formic Pro to treat for Varroa destructor mites, that also slows down your brood production. What I don't like about it is if you're not experienced and you do it at the wrong time with the wrong temperatures and things like that, you can risk damaging your queen. So, but the way he was talking about it, uh, it does reduce your brood, reduces your numbers and could again thwart the uh, tendency to swarm. So another potential control measure and then of course you're killing Varroa destructor mites in the process, but you might consider getting your queen out of there for that. So that's it for that. Question number five, Barry from Oakland, California. I live in USDA zone 10A. Our only frosts are very light and usually if they happen are in January. The bees dwindle, but there is no natural brood break. I have a monstrous stand of eucalyptus nearby that I have never taken advantage of because they just aren't enough bees during the bloom, which peaks around Valentine's Day. Almost a monofloral environment this early. I'd like to try to get it. My question is, in my mild but still early season, what is the best way to capture this nectar flow? Okay, I wasn't going to include Barry's question. Um, but I think it's important because a lot of people uh, think that there's a nectar flow nearby and they want their bees to use it. And uh, in some cases, people have invested a lot of money in growing a specific plant, planting a specific tree variety, and then having their bees completely ignore it. When there's a nectar flow from a specific plant, you know, source, whether these flowers are on trees or some flowering plant that's uh, just growing wild or in the ditches or you've planted it and your bees are ignoring it, that's actually good news. Not for you who have invested in that and hope to get that specific nectar source for your honey. It's good news because it means your bees are finding stuff elsewhere and they don't need it because bees that are starving go after anything. You see them on plants you will not normally ever see them on. I saw bees on Queen Anne's lace this year. Not a lot of them, but I've never even paid attention to Queen Anne's Lace. But if the bees are desperate for some reason, if some other resource isn't available, they'll use it. There's no way I know of to direct your bees to a specific plant or tree, you know, trees or flowers. Uh, 
There's no way to direct your bees to go for just that. I will say this because it's interesting when people are planning their spring flower arrangements and I'm getting several questions about the seeds, how to plant, things like that. So it is something to look forward to because look where we are, we're in November. November is passing fast and uh, this is part of what I'll talk about at the end of today's uh, presentation, but thinking about what you're gonna plant, how you're gonna plant it, and whether or not your bees will use it. That is uh, something that we're all going to have to become aware of. And uh, my other advice is, if you already have a lot of one variety of a plant in your area, why plant more? Why not plant something different? Create some diversity. But I know of no way to direct your bees to go to a specific source, unless it's the last thing that's out there. Question number six, moving on. This comes from Clayton. And uh, we're in the 40s and 50s here now in Idaho. Is it okay to put out, like you said, when it's sunny, without them overproducing brood to give them a tiny one up this winter? Is this better than a pollen patty? Okay, so what this is in reference to is day before yesterday, was it yesterday or the day before? Day before yesterday, I put up a time-lapse video of the bees on dry pollen substitute. And uh, the sun was out, it was 60, and the bees seem to know when bad weather's coming, they get really intense about resources that they can find. So I put out dry pollen sub, AP23, Mega B, and Ultra B dry pollen subs. Why did I do it? Well, the Ultra B, I had to get rid of it anyway because I'm at the bottom of the bucket. And uh, I don't like to keep old pollen sub around. Keep in mind, I have more than 30 colonies of bees. So to answer this question, without them overproducing brood to give them a tiny one up this winter. So first of all, when I feed dry pollen substitute, AP23 scientifically was the top performer. Mega B scientifically was the number two performer. Ultra B almost didn't make it on the chart. But when you put it out, it's what the bees find first, go after first, and a lot of people suggest that, well, it must be loaded with sugar or something else that's enticing them beyond the nutritional profiles. But if you also look at the nutritional profile of Ultra B, it has a very high protein content and uh, they claim, of course, everyone who produces a pollen sub claims that it does fantastic things for boosting your bees. But uh, I do not put pollen patties or pollen subs or any pollen anything inside my hives. Never. Uh, this spring, I probably shouldn't say never, but this spring I was trying to test the Ultra B pollen patties. And I wanted to do that to see if I could get a comparison. And this was the most fundamental of tests. And the reason I didn't report on it or share about it or create a video is because the differences between putting ultra or hive alive uh, pollen patties and the control, which is of course a colony with no pollen patties, hived at the same time, roughly the same numbers in them, uh, the Hive Alive Pollen Patty seemed to produce more frames of brood than the one, the control, that did not have it, right? But now we're talking about one nucleus hive against one nucleus hive set up at the exact same time. So if you're creating splits and things like that, but when do we do that, right? We do that at a time when there are abundant resources coming in, and by that I mean nectar and pollen. Pollen's coming through the landing boards, nectar's out there, um, pollen patties and things like that are not needed at that time of year. So that test does not apply to the fall. So this is where I'm as science-based as I possibly can be when it comes to recommending things. So what I have to tell you is that your pollen patties have not proven to be significantly better in producing more brood. So likewise, if we say that we put out dry pollen substitute, as Clayton is saying here, wouldn't that give them a big brood boost at a time when you really don't want that? And it really doesn't because this was part of the pollen patty testing that goes on is that uh, 
insignificant results mean that with or without pollen patties, they were not necessarily boosted as far as brood goes. Keep in mind too, I have no small hive beetle problems where I live. So you do risk, of course, enticing small hive beetles if you live south of where I am. I'm in the northeastern United States. We're already cold here. Uh, if I were in a southern area or an area that has a lot of small hive beetles, my concern would be that now I'm potentially feeding small hive beetles. I don't want to have to get in there to have to check them. I'm very, very fortunate. I don't know why I don't have small hive beetles. I have free range chickens that forage in my apiary constantly. Um, there are a lot of reasons. Uh, yeah, I am colder. I'm at a higher elevation. I get lake effect snow. We have not had snow yet this year. But uh, pollen patties are expensive. So let's start there. You have to question, why do you as a backyard beekeeper want to put pollen patties, no matter who makes them, you know, um, why do you want to put those in your hive? You have to break the seals to get them in there. Um, you're going to put them over the brood frames where your cluster currently is. And my clusters, by the way, are all in the lower boxes. They're all focused near their entrances right now. So they have a lot of space above them uh, to go into winter with. So in order to put a pollen patty this time of year where it would benefit them, it would have to be down a box. So in other words, now with the weather getting colder, the bee is no longer propolizing everything. The bee is no longer doing wax work inside their hives. I would be breaking those seals just to put something in that would only provide, according to the scientific results, it would only provide minimal uh, gains for them, if any, right? So when they say, when you read a scientific paper and it says results were not significant, they're basically saying it wasn't enough to justify the additional cost and, and the activity that you have to do to add something like a pollen patty. So where would it work? And where would you use it or where would you need it? Now, if you're in jeopardy of losing your colony of bees, and you're in an area where you do not have resources necessary to sustain your hives. So there are arid areas where pollen has not been available for a long time. And that's where pollen patties and things like that can mean the difference between your colony surviving winter or not surviving winter. So without pollen patties, my bees where I am, they have enough of these resources. It would be a waste of money for me to do that. If you want to know, and you're, if you're in the United States specifically, if you want to know what your area is like as far as dearth goes, then I'm going to recommend that you visit this website that I bring up all the time, bscape.org, B-E-E-S-C-A-P-E.org, and you will get a rating for where you live regarding forage quality and availability and whether or not there is a dearth. Now, if I were in a strong dearth and my colonies did not have pollen in them at all, because I can see the observation hives are my litmus test for the rest of the apiary. Every observation hive has pollen in it. I don't need to add anything. So the next question is, Fred, why'd you put out dry pollen sub uh, if your bees don't need it? because I'm doing another thing, is I'm occupying these foragers that are going out, that are finding nothing. I'm keeping them off the landing boards of other hives. And the second part is, what do they prefer? So it's easy because I have all these different pollen subs, uh, and this is not pollen, keep in mind it's a pollen substitute. So these are formula that are designed to get your bees to use them, and then who uses them? So the second part of this is, the bees inside the hive that actually ingest those proteins this time of year will differ from the bees that use those proteins, let's say in spring or midsummer. The bees this time of year, which bees will you find pollen in their digestive system? Randy Oliver did a very interesting study and Randy Oliver demonstrated that there were benefits to pollen patties, for example, in his area where there is a profound pollen dearth, right? So he squashed the bee guts of the different nurse bees in the hive in the wintertime, and guess what? They all had pollen in their digestive system, which tells us that wintering bees 
also consume and benefit from those proteins, right? Keep in mind, these bees become the nutrition source for late season or midwinter brood at a time when resources are not coming into the hive. So if we talk about fat-bodied winter bees and their ability to produce resources that rear brood in the absence of incoming pollen, this means they have it in their body, they have it stored, and they're gonna metabolize it, and they're gonna produce the royal jelly and the formula those bees need to develop during their larva stage, right? So this is why what's happening this time of year is different than other times of year. So we're not necessarily boosting brood. The other thing is the amount that I'm putting out. I put out two egg cartons of each, spread out for more than 30 colonies of bees. That had almost zero impact, except that I occupied them. So it did not boost brood. So since we also know this is my logic, so I'm explaining it to you. If we also know that if I had taken full-blown pollen patties, the expensive ones, the best ones I could find, global patties, Hive Alive pollen patties, which Hive Alive pollen patties are made by Global too. So here's the thing. If I put those in and those only generate a marginal difference, I really haven't boosted brood no matter what. So there you go. Not necessary. So putting the pollen subs out, it just lets me answer the question. If your goal is to get this nutrition and this formula into your bees, the popularity of these pollen subs with the bees would play. And for example, let's say I read all the papers and I thought, aha, AP23, the clear winner. That's the only one I'm going to get. They're sold by Daydont, right? So I go to Daydont and I get that bag and it's 29 bucks for five pounds of it. If you put that out by itself, you would see bees on it. You would go, wow, they're taking it. That looks cool. And, you know, there's, you know, like one egg carton. I use egg cartons because bees get their footing. They never get trapped in it. They fly away. Um, so in the egg carton, you see that, oh, there's, you know, there's 50 or 100 bees on that. If I didn't know better, I would think, wow, that's pretty good. They're taking it. That's pretty good. But if we realize that there are hundreds of thousands of bees less than 100 feet away from where I'm offering that, that's actually not a very good number. So now let's put away the AP23 and let's bring out um, Megabee. Megabee had marginally more, you know, attention from the bees than the AP23 did. And this is interesting too, because if AP23 is a formula is more superior in a lab environment than uh, Megabee. And Megabee uh, comes from Better Bee, right? So now we've got Megabee out there. They did okay, a couple hundred bees. Looks like they like it. But then you take out Ultra Bee and you bring that out there. The bees are flying to it while I'm carrying it. So that's interesting too, because I was concerned when I did my initial test. This isn't the first time I've done these comparisons. When I did my initial test, I was concerned in the spring, early spring, we're talking March, when I put out the um, Ultra B, my concern was that I had already triggered them to seek that formula. So I really needed to be careful in the release arrangement. So in other words, which pollen sub do I put out first? Because if you put out Ultra B first and they go back to the hive and they do their waggle dance, they decide this is what we want. They get the reinforcement from uh, the nurse bees are inside the hive and they want them to go out and get more of it. And of course, the foragers that go out to get pollen, they don't pass it off to another bee. They pass it directly into the cells in the hive. So if they're already identifying a source, the smell that they want, and when they're doing their waggle dances, of course, the bees are sensing the dancer. They're also smelling the pollen that's on their corbicula and they're headed to that location. And then when they get in the vicinity, they home in on that scent, right? So I had to be careful to change the order because spring I was concerned about, since I put out Ultra B first, that may be why they showed that preference. So this time I switched it around and the first thing I put out was AP23. Once I had bees going to that, hour later, put out Mega B. Once I had bees going to that, hour later, put out Ultra B. The difference was dramatic. So when I put out the Ultra B dry pollen sub, I put a time-lapse camera on it. 
And it didn't occur to me that not only would they mob it, but they would take it down to nothing and clean the egg cartons. While the other two, to this minute, are half full. And of course, they're out in the rain now. Nobody cares about that. So the logic for me, the backyard beekeeper, is you can have all the nutrition in the world. All of these companies have invested in the protein profiles of their pollen substitutes, right? And uh, if you can't get your bees to consume it in adequate quantities, then the results are likewise going to be much reduced. In lab environments, they make specific uh, pollen subs available, right? And uh, they can identify how much of it's consumed, how much of it gets metabolized, and then of course the end result is what's the result of having fed that pollen substitute to nurse bees, does that translate into more brood? So did it trigger the queen's egg production? Because remember, your queen is also getting proteins. Uh, so here's the thing. The ultra bee was a clear winner. Uh, did it impact overall brood in my hives? No, it's just too small. It's too small. But it demonstrated that if I needed it, if I were in a dearth area, I would have to say, you know, just based on those results, if you're looking for the pollen substitute that your bees go after the most, that was the clear winner. Nothing to do with Man Lake. Zero. Let's be clear. These are passive tests. I don't have any interest in who wins it. Daydant didn't give me anything. Uh, Better Bee did not give me anything. They didn't give me the Mega Bee. I tested it all on my own. And the cheapest one, actually, was Ultra Bee. I bought it in 10 pound, 10 pound pail from Amazon. So, is it better than a pollen patty? Yes, here's why. It occupies them as forage. I don't like putting things inside my hive for another reason. See, I'm having an afterthought right now. You put in a pollen patty, okay. Very few backyard beekeepers are doing post-consumption science. And by that, I mean, once you're feeding your bees something, are you collecting a sampling of those bees? Are you smushing their guts the way Randy Oliver does? And are you looking at the content of their guts? No, we're not. We look at consumption, right? So you've got a pollen patty that's in there and the bees worked it. When we say the bees are really working this, what do we mean? The pollen patty is disappearing. Now, this is always my concern when something gets put inside a hive. It's disappearing. Did they metabolize it? Or are they just tearing it up and even potentially just getting rid of it? Bees don't like foreign material in their hive, even though we know that pollen patty or that winter patty or whatever we put in there uh, is really beneficial. But look where we put it, down in between the boxes directly over their brood. Some bees make it ants in their pants and decide they just have to get rid of that stuff. It happens with sugar, by the way. I've seen bees hauling dry sugar right out of the entrance. So just because it's disappearing does not validate that it's been consumed. So we need to look for things like that. Now, if they're going up into, so if you've got an inner cover and you've got it as an emergency feed, I don't even personally, again, this is, this is personal preference, my opinion. We're sitting down, have a coffee. Hey, Fred, would you put for yourself and your bees, would you put a pollen patty up in your feeder shim in place of fondant or sugar or candy board or something like that? No, I would not. I would not put the pollen patty or the winter patty up there in place of fondant or some other pure energy source that just is designed to get your bees through winter if they've consumed all of their honey, right? I am a fan of having that emergency resource leaving the proteins out. I don't see any reason for that for the backyard beekeeper. We're not pollinators. We're not trying to make the grade. We're not trying to boost, you know, brood production artificially. In a perfect world, we want your bees to be bringing in everything they need through the year. And uh, the more we mess with that diet, unless again, see, I'm sorry to be all over the chart on this. If you're doing it to every one of your hives, 
you don't know uh, what's benefiting them and what isn't. So I like the 50-50 approach. If you've got six colonies of bees in your backyard, do it to six of them and leave the other six with nothing but a bonus sugar resource to get them through winter if it gets to that point. So, talked about it too much, beating a dead horse. Those are my thoughts. So, read the studies. Studies are out there. Studies are done under lab conditions often. And uh, again, if you're in a dearth, an area where your bees would starve or die without it, then you need it. If uh, we have conflicts between, you know, what goes on at the University of Florida and what goes on with Randy Oliver's studies regarding the benefits, the significant benefits of pollen patties, dietary supplements, things like that. So here we go. It depends on where you live. All beekeeping is local, as they say. Moving on to question number seven comes from Seth, Ridgefield, Connecticut. I watched episode 232 this morning and brought up something I've been wondering about. Can I split eight or 10 frame hive to a four or five frame hives with a slatted rack using a single entrance? You also mentioned that you can have a single super, flow super in my case. Could I also have a single Ross round super instead of or in addition to the flow frames? Okay, so here's the thing, a slatted rack does not the slatted rack this is a slatted rack this is designed to service a single hive a single colony of bees if we did a split and we put nukes over each side of this the slatted rack does nothing to keep your bees and the queen and everything else from wandering into either side the other thing is if you're creating a split um, with a queen excluder, the best system that I saw and what we were talking about when I talked uh, to the guys from the Keeper's Hive, I saw a configuration. They have the single queen system, which has five frame nukes on top of one side of a deep box, right? Then they had another one called the two queen system, which I liked, and I'll explain why. And it's not, I don't think they have an innovation regarding how they're configuring everything, but this is not a new way. Uh, when you double up, so we have a 10 frame and a 10 frame or an eight frame and an eight frame. And these are individual colonies of bees. They're established, they have queens, they have brood, they have everything. Then we put on top of that queen excluders, but you also have to block half of it and then center it up. So we have two hives side by side, common middle wall, right? Or double walls if you've just pushed two hives together. And then you put a single super above that, but there's queen excluders. So now we've got a queen over here, queen over here, their own brood, but their workers go up into the same supers. The one question that came up is don't they fight? No, they don't. Not only that, they could even interchangeably go down through either hive that they want. The queens have no contact with each other. Okay. Now, what's interesting about that is in these upper boxes, there will be no development of a replacement queen because the pheromone from both of these hives is spreading through everything, right? So the idea of a, you know, instead of a four cylinder engine generating the power that we need to produce resources, we've got an eight cylinder engine. We've got two hives producing and contributing to the same resource. And so that, in my opinion, would be a great way to super horse one of those flow supers because a flow super is big, thick, and heavy. If you put that up there, I think it would work. Yeah. So if you look at the keeper's hive, I highly recommend you go there. That particular uh, method of handling bees was not new. What was new and novel was, of course, the keeper's hive and how they were using nukes up above and then they were able to attend to the frames without lifting any boxes off. So for those who have troubles lifting that want to stick to a five frame nuke and want to cycle things out and have some production, then uh, the keeper's hive was a really cool thing to have. If you're doing double brood boxes to a single column of honey super, then um, I liked their two queen system setup. So you could even, those things you could modify yourself. You would need of course to block out half of that and then only have a queen excluder to the middle 
it's something that you'd have to work out. By the way, I did notice I looked at a couple of videos on double hive uh, management with single, so they're contributing to the same honey supers. I would highly recommend that the queen excluder that you use be the metal kind with the wooden frame around it. Don't just use one of the little plastic queen excluders up there. Have something that's rigid, that has a real form to it. Metal queen excluders with a wooden trim around them are personally what I would recommend you get if you're going to manipulate your hives like that and fool around with everything. Now, yeah, that's what I would do. Enough said. Lots of room for experimentation there. And uh, check those guys out. And uh, you might just get some ideas for yourself, for your own apiary. So that's the end of it for today. So we're going to move on to the fluff section really quick here. And uh, winter's here. Let's just pretend that it is next week. Thanksgiving, by the way. Happy Thanksgiving ahead of time because I won't be talking to you until Black Friday. And uh, Black Friday's coming. And that, for the beekeeper, is uh, a time to really take advantage of everything. Hopefully. By the way, if you know of is Man Lake or Dayton or Better Bee, whoever's offering Black Friday deals of stuff that we need, and I don't want them to just offload surplus stuff. If there are things that we need, post it down in the comments section. What are the good deals coming up on Black Friday? There's also Cyber Monday, so I don't know which one we fall under for that. But if you know of any really good beekeeping deals, feel free to post that down in the comment section of this video. Uh, it's a great time of year to get the biggest bang for your buck right now. And you're shopping for your favorite beekeeper. So if you know a beekeeper that needs stuff, this is the time to get it. Start getting those stocking stuffers and things like that. So uh, with your beehives, winter's here. Hopefully you have done everything that you can possibly do and that they're ready to go. That you've insulated the covers and all that stuff. That you've done everything you can. Uh, make sure you have emergency resources. I know that some people will write and say that I only give them honey and nothing else. And that's fine. I'm not saying that you have to do anything else. But if you were my mentees and I was getting you through your first couple of winters, I'm going to tell all of those who are learning from me who want to follow my guidelines, I'm going to encourage them all to have some kind of emergency resource on top of their inner cover so that if the bees get to that point, it's not just doom and gloom. So for those that want to do Darwinian beekeeping, nothing against you. You can live and let die. You can do whatever you want to do. But uh, I have to tell you, fondant, dry sugar, candy boards, whatever you decide to do, the mountain camp method, please make sure those resources are there. Okay, the other thing is some people, um, all right, that's pretty much it. Moving on. Make sure you have straps on your hives. Winter storms come. You don't want to look out in a snowstorm. And much as I did in my second year of beekeeping, come home from school and see all my hives laying in the snow with the boxes apart. The whole hive stand failed. So look at your hive stands. Are they tipping a little bit right now? Because if they are, this is the time to fix them. You don't want to do have to be out there in a foot of snow in a blizzard. Think about it. 20 degrees Fahrenheit, 60 mile an hour winds. We had that last year. Uh, make sure your stuff is strapped down. And by the way, I experimented with some of the straps, the quick straps that you just pull through and they've got the little pinch on them. Those are out. I am not happy with those at all. I'm back to ratchet straps for all of my hives. They keep tension. They're fantastic. I'm back to nothing but ratchet straps. I don't like the quick straps that you pull and they snug up and they just don't hold the tension. So I can't recommend those anymore. So strap them down. There are yard anchors. So those are those augers that screw into your yard that will, you can strap your beehive to the stand and use augers to strap your stand to the ground. So if you really are in an area where you get high winds. And uh, by the way, uh, a lot of people talk about blocking the wind, putting your bees in a shielded area. I have both, so I have bees that are sheltered from wind and I have bees completely exposed in a lower field with nothing stopping the prevailing winds and my wintering differences were insignificant. So the word is uh, if your hive equipment fits together well and if your entrance 
you're, we talk about entrance direction, do not face your entrance at prevailing winds. So my entrance is predominantly, and in that particular apiary, they all face south. So the wind is coming out of the west where I live. So wherever your prevailing winds are, try to make sure that your entrance isn't oriented so those winds blow straight in. But good hive equipment that's fitted together well, that doesn't have a bunch of gaps in it and stuff like that, will handle these winter winds that come through. So um, what else do we have? Have an entrance cleaner. Your little blue, some kind of little hook that you can clean dead bees out of the entrances. I recommend you do that every time you're in your bee yard. Uh, if you've got exposed joints at this point, if you've got some hives that aren't in great shape and you can see little bee faces in there, it's time to wrap those joints. So you can use landscape cloth. Um, a couple of our members of our bee club are using double bubble to wrap the whole beehive. If you find gaps now, you kind of have to do that because it's too late to fix them. Winter's here. It's coming. Don't pull apart your stuff. Wrap them now. So keep abreast of the different sales that are coming up. Look for seeds for the coming springtime. They're all going to be earned seeds. Um, Eden Brothers and these organic seed companies are all going to be offering their seeds at discounts now. So this is a time to get a hold of those and think about spring. So that's it. That's all we have for this Friday. And I want to thank you for being here and for watching. If you have questions, write them in the comment section down below. Please follow the link to thewaytobe.org and click on the page, mark the way to be. Fill out your question. Also, if you're watching this now and you've got time on your hands and you want to talk to people about bees, please Google the way to be fellowship and it will take you to a facebook group the way to be you can talk to people from all over the world about anything that's on your mind related to beekeeping thanks for being here thanks for watching i hope you have a fantastic weekend